In this lesson, we will talk about the history and the development of atomic theory. We didn't always know about protons, neutrons, electrons, or even that there were atoms. So we're going to go through some of the reasons that, historical reasons, that chemists came to this conclusion. But first, a few footnotes. This video is going to be a little bit different than a lot of mine because there's going to be uh, a whole lot of information and I'm going to go real fast and it'll be a little long. It's kind of a lot of information packed in here. So I'm going to go pretty quickly. I don't want this to be a 30 minute video. I want to get through it kind of quickly. I, I will explain some things on here. Others I will kind of leave to explain more in class. Uh, the purpose here is to get the information in your notes. We want to make sure that you have uh, particularly names. We want to think about names of people and what they did, what laws they go with. Those are the kinds of things that will be quizzed on. Uh, there's just too much here to write it all down, so I'm going to tell you what you need to write and what you don't, so be paying attention to that as we go. So, uh, if we go all the way back in history, we can begin talking about the atom back all the way with the Greeks. The Greeks uh, didn't really give us the history. They didn't really in show us that the atom existed, but they did come up with the very first idea that the atom existed, the tiny, tiniest little part of particles. So, uh, never mind that. So, uh, a couple of Greek philosophers. And this is a key point. Uh, this is important to know, something to write down. The Greeks were philosophers. Uh, they were not scientists in the modern sense. They did not uh, do experiments. They did a lot of sitting around thinking and asking each other what, what they thought was right. And so this is a Democritus. Democritus is the first uh, very important name to know. Democritus gave us the very first idea of the atom. I don't even know that we should call it a model so much. Uh, he was a philosopher. Uh, the word democracy came from him. And here's what I want you to write down about Democritus. He came up with the idea of the atom, and he gave us the name atom. Atomos means indivisible, so uh, tomos is their infinitive for uh, to cut, and a is a neg negative prefix, as in like apathy, apathy or Atheist, it means not. So the word atom literally means uncuttable, indivisible, cannot be cut. And so uh, Democritus thought that maybe there was some tiniest piece of matter that couldn't be cut, and so he called it the uncuttable thing, or atom. He had no experiments. He wasn't a scientist. He was a philosopher. So uh, those are the key things about Democritus. Uh, after that, for the next several uh, hundreds, thousands of years, we had alchemy, which, uh, if you want to read about that, you can. That won't be on the tests or anything. They did kind of give us some in experimental techniques. They helped us to isolate the first elements and came up with some glassware. And so now we get into the stuff that is really important, the foundations of atomic theory. Why do we believe that atoms exist? So there are a series of laws. Remember what a law is. A law is something, a general pattern of nature. We're not sure why. These were discovered by scientists of the day. First is the law of conservation of mass by the man by the name of Antoine Lavoisier. You'll, uh, you should write this down and leave a space for the name because the name will come up in a later slide. And you can write down the name of the law, what it says, and uh, in a moment you'll come back and write their names. You can uh, pause this. I'm not going to give you time to write, so pause and write this down. The second law is the law of definite proportions, and the third is the law of multiple proportions. So pause that and write those down. Okay, now we're ready to move on. So uh, that is the name of the guy... Uh, that's how you spell Antoine Lavoisier. He was a Frenchman. He discovered this law any time that, what it says is that at any time that you had any kind of chemical reaction, the total mass that you had of all the reactants before and after were the same, which isn't obvious, wasn't obvious at the time. A lot of times people thought when things burned, for example, that they would get lighter, that the products were lighter than the reactants, but it turned out that those uh, they just were losing gases, and once uh, Lavoisier accounted for that through experimentation, he showed that the total mass never changed. 
Uh, Proust is the name of the guy who did the second law. law. That law is actually a couple of names. You need to have both names down. Law of definite proportions is also known as the law of constant composition. His name was Proust, Joseph Proust. And uh, we'll get to law of uh, multiple proportions in a second. Let's talk for a second about what the law of constant composition says. It says that each compound has a specific ratio of elements by mass. So if you were to uh, take a compound and break it up into its elements and weigh the two elements, the ratio of the two would always be the same. And for example, water always has a ratio of eight times as much oxygen as it does hydrogen. Finally, we have the law of multiple proportions, which is a uh, law proposed or discovered by John Dalton, which is a little bit... Uh, um, well, we can talk more about this in class. This is probably not a great thing to talk about on a video where we can't interact. So you can uh, just make sure that you had the definition uh, from the few slides back, and then you can uh, have the name Dalton here. Let's skip through this example. And now we come to uh, the big theory. Once we see that we have the word theory involved, we know we have somebody explaining something really well. This theory came from John Dalton, the same guy who came up with the law of multiple proportions, and he proposed the first atomic theory. Remember, Democritus did not pr pr propose a theory. Democritus just proposed a model with no evidence and a name, atom. So Dalton gave us the atomic theory, which has four points. Oops, four points. <laughs> The first one, uh, these, this is, remember, his explanation for all these laws we just looked at. Uh, he explained, first of all, that all matter is made of uh, these, these four points you need to write down. These are critical. Uh, the all, all matter is made of tiny indivisible, that does say indivisible or uncuttable, not invisible particles called atoms. And atoms of the same element are identical but those of different atoms are different because they have different weights. Atoms of different elements combine in whole number of ratios to form compounds, and the chemical in reactions involve the rearrangement of atoms, and no new atoms are created or destroyed. If you're, uh, if you're reading carefully, you can sort of see some of those laws kind of restated in uh, atom terms in those four points. So... Uh, this was the first model, the very first model of the atom, a uh, scientific model. We call this the first modern atomic theory because Democritus's was not modern. It did not use experiment, did not uh, use science or measurement. So Dalton gave us the first modern atomic theory. And this is the theory, this was the explanation that convinced just about everyone that atoms did in fact exist. So yes, we can see atoms today, but it was this explanation using these ways of visualizing why all those laws are true that convinced everyone. So that was the theory, remember. Uh, this theory said that uh, you essentially had different atoms of different elements that were different because of what they weighed, and they, each atom was kind of just uncuttable and divisible. Well, we're going to find that experiments in, in science were always open to questioning our assumptions and our explanations. We'll find that this theory can get a little bit better, and we find some things that had to be changed, minor things about the uh, theory, as we got more evidence. So the first problem with atomic theory was uh, the Crookes tube. Uh, and the Crookes tube is something uh, I'm not going to explain a lot here because there's a whole other video of me doing this and I'll do this in class, but the basic idea is that you have these things going through this tube which are deflected by a magnet. Clearly these things are coming out of atoms because according to atomic theory everything in here is made of atoms and there is no way to explain this because uh, in order to be deflected by a magnet, you had to have a charge, and there was nothing in the atom that involved any kind of a charge. So, we had to come up with a new model for the atom that did include charge. And that, uh, um, originally, this whole charge idea came from J.J. Thompson. So, J.J. Thompson, looking at a Crookes tube, he figured out that there must be something inside of an atom 
that was a tiny negative particle. And uh, he figured that all atoms had to have them. He also knew that overall that the uh, charges had to balance out because atoms didn't generally weren't generally charged. They don't. It's not like whenever you touch matter that you get shocked. So William Thompson. This is where it gets really confusing. J. J. Thompson just told us that electrons existed. J. J. Thompson just discovered the electron, and now a new Thompson, William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, proposed a way to think about the atom that. Uh, incorporated these negative charges. And so we call this the plum pudding model. His idea was that we had the atom itself was like kind of like plum pudding. We would maybe say blueberry muffin today where the entire muffin itself is kind of like the atom and the tiny negative electrons, we call them, inside of the atom were like blueberries. So we have this negative charges embedded into a positively charged spherical cloud, as it says here. Um, so uh, we started with Dalton's model, which you need to have in your notes, and now we have uh, Thompson discovered the electron. That's another thing. And now we've got uh, the Thompson, the other Thompson, Kelvin, gives us the plum pudding model, or sometimes we call it the blueberry muffin model of the atom. Uh, and this was a summary of what that looked like. And more slides. We don't kind of just talked about all these. And now we get to the final model that we're going to talk about, which is the Rutherford model, or the nuclear model of the atom we learned about as nucleus. Well, here's why. So, blah, 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 the gold foil experiment. We're going to talk about the gold foil experiment. The gold foil experiment had this idea that we were going to take this uh, idea of the, of the Thompson or the plum pudding model that had basically had the atom all kind of spread out over a large space with tiny negative things inside. We're going to test it by shooting it with these super high energy things called alpha particles. And they should blast right through, just like you kind of see on this picture. Those should go straight through uh, like this. You should, those should come right through like that. And whoop. So this is a uh, demonstration of what it should look like. He should ex he expected the alpha particles to kind of go right through. It was a similar way to think about it is what would happen if you took a piece of Kleenex and shot a shotgun at it. It should go right through because uh, the Kleenex shouldn't be big enough to stop it. So that's what he expected them to go right through. But in fact, uh, and there's another picture, lots of ways keep seeing all the different ways it should have happened, but that's not what happened. What happened instead was he saw that many times it did go through, but a lot of times it ricocheted off in weird directions. So most of the time it did go right through like expected, but not always. And so he had to come up with a way to explain this. And the way he explained it was he said that uh, since a lot of the particles went through. The reason they went through was that the atom was almost completely empty and all of its mass was concentrated into these tiny, tiny, tiny little area in the center. And so th when it was hitting these small positive things, it was bouncing off. And so he figured that they had to have a positive, really dense part of the atom. So most of the atom was empty, but there was a tiny dense part. And he called that the nucleus. And so if we kind of look now, this uh, in the plum pudding model, we see the alpha particles represented by arrows should have just gone right through. But in the nuclear model, we see that they would only go through if they didn't hit the nucleus. But if they hit the nucleus, they would bounce off because the nucleus was so dense and positive. And so this new nuclear model of the atom is called the Rutherford model. Uh, here is another demonstration. You can see most of the uh, alpha beams coming in just going right through because they miss the tiny little nucleus in the center. But every once in a while you'd have one come in and happen to hit that tiny thing and bounce off in a weird direction. And so that is how he figured out that the... Woo! That's how he figured out that uh, the atom had a nucleus. And so that is a really quick introduction of a lot of the uh, name. So Rutherford, Thompson, the other Thompson, Democritus, Proust, Lavoisier, Dalton, 
those are important names. Make sure you got down in your notes what they all did.